Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior. I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. I'm Pastor Witt. Glad you came to worship with us today. Today's Palm Sunday. It begins the, the greatest week of the entire year. Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter when Jesus is raised from the dead. Hope you're being safe. Hope you're taking care of each other, your neighbors, your family. Hope you've gotten your vaccine if your doctor's told you it's okay and you really need to, uh, to do what they tell you to do. And if you can get it and they say it's okay, dive in line as soon as you can. Some folks are getting really frustrated because they don't seem to be able to, to get the phone call, but uh, there are more of them coming. Ed's doing a great job with his team. We have a few people that are sick in the hospital. If you'd like to know who they are, please give Carrie a call or an email and let her know that you want to be placed on that prayer list uh, dissemination group. Uh, we're not going to mention them online. Thanks for your financial support. Um, we're hoping with the $1,400 coming through that we'll get some special gifts for Easter and, and kick us up a notch. In this time of the year, it always dips a little bit. It's just a part of what happens. But you can mail to us at 717 Tucson Road, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23462. You can go online. You can bring it up by the door. Or you can come to in-person worship. It begins this Sunday at 10 o'clock. Next Sunday for Easter, we'll have a 645 on the lawn um, sunrise, S-O-N, rise service. And then we'll have a 10 o'clock in-person worship. You can now bring your children under the age of two. Uh, before, we couldn't have them because they couldn't keep masks on. Now they don't have to wear masks, and, and they're welcome. Everyone else in the room needs to wear a mask. We still have social distancing. You no longer have to go online and fill out the paperwork. Uh, on the, you simply let us know that you're coming so that we have uh, an accounting sort of as to how many folks are, are going to be with us. Um, I think that's about it. I really do appreciate your support for the ministries. Um, this is a Wednesday and I'm having to tape in the afternoon because in the morning the phone is just pretty steady around here with people needing help. And if you see Terry, you need to give her a big thanks because it's amazing how well she can help people find different avenues as well as what we offer to people too. Thanks for your, your help with our food pantries, Ascension and the others. Some of you are working with a couple of the food pantries. Thank you very much. Um, we just gave another thousand dollars to Union Mission to help feed people during Easter. Thank you very much for that. And uh, some good stuff going on around here. Anyway, it's time to worship. Glad you came. Let's take a couple moments to center ourselves on Jesus before we begin our worship. Please join me in the call to worship. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, 
Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes! Blessed is the one who comes! In the name of the Lord! In the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. We have seen that the stories of Jesus' healing ministry are filled with words and deeds. When he rides into Jerusalem, the people had hoped he would heal the oppressive system they were living under. We know that this healing was not confined to that moment in history, but offers a new way of life that has made a case for compassion for all, especially the least, ever since. As we head into the events of Holy Week, we begin to see that our ability to forgive ourselves and others is the foundation that can transform infirmities and allow us to move on. We integrate our beliefs and actions for the health of the whole. The parade of compassionate power we celebrate today is underscored by another healing story of transformation, symbolizing our ability to fuel our movement of recovery. We glorify God for beautiful words and works of wholeness and share that treasured beauty with others. We know that there will still be pain, but we also know love will win. Vessels holy and whole, broken, needing the one, open body and soul, healer, come. We have approached confession each week in Lent in such a way that we lay bare the brokenness in order to begin the process of healing. Along the way, we have acknowledged our need to restore our own holy vessels while attending to our role in the healing of the community and the world. The work of healing will continue as we integrate all we have learned with all that we will do moving forward. For now, we remember how hard it is to move from thinking to doing. Let us pray. Forgiving God, we have opened ourselves to healing, and sometimes it is easier to pray nice prayers than to do the hard work of putting into action what needs to happen. Help us remember the sacred nature of the holy vessels that we are, fragile and susceptible to shattering, and yet capable of transformation. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to believe in our ability to change and heal as you believe in us. Help us, healer. Show us our strength. Forgive our inertia. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care. In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Help us, healer. Show us our ability to chart a different course. Forgive our inaction. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. I invite you to return to that warm orb of light that lives deep within you once again. It may already be aglow with the excitement of the parade, the presence of Jesus leading us on. But if you're struggling, or have struggled in this season of recovery to feel this warmth of assurance within you, do not despair. You are not the one who has to create the light. It just is. And it's a pilot light that never goes out. You will at some time begin to notice it returning to your awareness. Know this. You are never alone in the struggle. No matter what. Jesus is on the journey with us. 
Life's parade is not passing you by. You are part of this body of Christ, a community seeking healing for you, for me, for all. Take a deep breath in to let this truth fill you and breathe out with the relief of assurance. Before anything else, let us breathe. When we purposefully breathe, each breath is a spirit breath. It's the breath of God Almighty in our lungs. Just like our bodies need oxygen, our souls need the breath of God working to heal us from the inside out. You know, it's good to belong to something special like a team or a choir or a church community or your whole big family. It can even feel good to belong to a large group of people who are cheering for something like maybe a PTA performance, or a crowd at a sporting events, or even a parade. It's hard to experience Palm Sunday without thinking of Jesus coming into Jerusalem while people waved palm branches and shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna is a special word that means to save or save now. People believed that Jesus was a special person who would help them. Let's play a game. Every time I wave my branch, I want you to shout, Hosanna. Watch out because I can be very Ricky. I think you did a great job following me. Following the right person at the right time is very important. And when you're on team, a uh, team, whose instructions should you follow? You're right, the coach. And if you're in the choir, 
Who should you follow? The choir director, of course. In an organized group like that, it's easy to know who to follow. But sometimes we find ourselves in large crowds and in situations where it's not always clear who to follow or what to do. A hero to all of us, Mr. Rogers, used to remind us to look for the helpers. There will always be people who are helping. And when it comes to knowing who to follow, follow the healers. Jesus was and is the ultimate healer, kind, loving, gently honest, full of grace and hope. And when he entered the city of Jerusalem, it wasn't like a warrior on a horse. He entered on a humble donkey as the Prince of Peace. The crowd cheered and they followed him. There would be other crowds um, around Jesus in the following days. One crowd in particular that forgot to follow the healers. Instead, they would follow hate and unkind words and calls to hurt Jesus. I wish that crowds like that didn't exist today, but they do. And so it's important that whenever we feel like we're in a crowd that could become harmful, for you to move to a safer place, to look for helpers, and to follow healers. When you can, talk to those helpers and healers about how you feel. God put those people in your life to help you and to heal you. When you spend your life looking for helpers and following healers, the next thing you know, you've become a helper and a healer too. And others will follow you and then the world will be all the better because of it. It's wonderful to know that no matter what we're going through, we can always turn to God in prayer. We can ask God for help for ourselves and for others, and God listens. God always hears our prayers. Loving God, we come to you with hearts, hands, minds, and souls in need of your healing touch. Heal us from the inside out so that we may reach out and help to heal your world. Amen. Mother Teresa was quoted as saying, We know only too well that what we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. But if the drop were not there, the ocean would be missing something. And James Baldwin, People pay for what they do, and still more for what they have allowed themselves to become. And they pay for it very simply, by the lives they lead. Help us hear your story, O Lord, and be born anew and live anew. Amen. Thank you.
This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. And after getting into a boat, he crossed the sea and came to his own town. And just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God who had given such authority to human beings. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, open us to receive from you. Open us to share with you. Help us to hear from you a message that will bring us closer to what you would have us to be. Help us to worship you in your holy name. Amen. As I indicated uh, today in the call to worship, no doubt you will notice that the scripture that was used there is the traditional scripture that's used on Palm Sunday, unless you're doing the Palm Passion Sunday, where you would add the entire thing. But the Palm Sunday, um, I can't ever come to Palm Sunday that I don't remember Israel, that I don't see in my mind the different pieces of Israel. I want to remind you that over the past few weeks, we have... Uh, spent a great deal of time in the upper Galilee, the kite-shaped lake, working our way back and forth across the lake. After, and as I said to you, reading Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and then 7 and, or 8 and 9, uh, the, the way that Jesus walks out his teachings about the Sermon on the Mount, um, it's really a powerful thing. And Jesus has has after doing this stirring of the people from the Jewish to the non-Jewish, uh, these healings that have happened over and over, Jesus has worked his way around to where he's going to, uh, to move south. And he moves down along this little teeny river, it's really a stream more than a river, to about Jericho. He crosses over at a location which is probably the location or close to the location where the Israelites originally crossed over into Israel. He comes into that city that they originally came into, uh, Jericho. My favorite story about Jericho is the one where he bumps into Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, Bar Timaeus, and um, the blind beggar. And he not only re restores sight to him, he also helps these people that are walking with them to receive sight about how they're to treat each other and and who they're to call outcasts. And I want to remind you that this trek that he's taking is, uh, is one that there are probably hundreds of people taking this road to Jerusalem because Passover in Jerusalem was one of those things that the folks wanted to do at least one time during their life. Many people did it each year, but it was, you know, I grew up in Winchester. And um, apple blossom was a big thing for us. When I lived there as a kid, there were 20, 25,000 people in Winchester. And the surrounding area uh, called Frederick County maybe had another 20 or 50,000. You maybe had 60, 70,000 people. But when apple blossom weekend came, it swelled. Uh, there was the largest fireman's parade on Friday, and I mean, it was massive. It went on for hours. Uh, they used to blow the horns and everything. Now they don't let them do it. The lights just come by. But then on Saturday was the big, giant apple blossom parade, and um, it's huge. There's more than a quarter of a million people show up for that weekend for the celebration. 
And so every time I get to Palm Sunday, I think about that kind of excitement and I can imagine as Jesus is working his way toward town, he has, he has done all these things in the Galilee area and he's walking along. And then in Jericho, he heals the sight of this blind man. He works his way from what is somewhere around a thousand feet below sea level up the old Jericho Road, and no doubt you'll remember the stories of the Jericho Road and, and the people who helped and didn't help a man who, was, uh, who had been jumped there. And you have to circle around down to the south and then come up a long ridge. And it's about 3,000 or so feet above sea level, so it's quite a hike to get there. And it passes through the Beths, Bethlehem. Bethany, Bethphage, these house of, house of fig, house, house of bread. And, um, you know, in Bethany, it, it, the scriptures tell us that, that a buddy of theirs was raised from the dead, Lazarus. And there's just this heightened expectation about this Jesus with this band of people, this steady flow of people working their way to Jerusalem. And as he approaches Jerusalem along this ridge, he sends his disciples out to go and get uh, a colt, uh, you know, and, and uh, a mother, and they, they bring the animals and spread the, some cloaks on top. Any of you guys ever ride animals? I've ridden uh, a fair amount of horses, broken a few. Um, this hill is fairly steep as it drops down into Jerusalem. There's no way I'd want to bareback an animal down this, and yet Jesus does it. And if that weren't bad enough, then the people begin to throw palm branches and their clothes, their, their outer cloaks on top. And so Jesus is riding down this hill on top of this stuff. Now, I know that this is to be a sign and a symbol of, of a great man coming into town. And um, as he's walking down the hill, on the left-hand side are tombs. They're still there today. You can go there and still see them. Some of them were used back in Jesus' day. The tombs are there on that left-hand side as you go down that little road. And on the other side were olives. And so you had the sign of death on one side and you had the sign of life on the other. And every year, I run back in my mind. I'm looking at it now, looking at going down that hill and seeing those olive trees and seeing those tombs that still exist there. Jesus, as he's coming down the hill, people are really excited. They're waving palm branches. It's beginning to make people very, very nervous. And I wondered, this week as I thought about it, I wondered if anybody, if Jesus or any of the disciples suddenly found themselves back in Galilee thinking about some of these stories that took place. And in particular, the one that we read this morning for the scripture. Because this story about this guy, Jesus is again coming back across the lake. And as he comes back across the lake, or as it's called here, the sea, it is a lake, and coming to his hometown of Capernaum, some folks came up carrying a, a man paralyzed on a, a, a cot on a... And Jesus sees him. And, and Jesus saw their faith in bringing the paralytic to him. And he says something that's very interesting. Anyone who was standing there would have been really amazed at his words. You know, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, my guess is this isn't what the man came for. And this isn't what his friends came for. They came hoping that this guy was going to be able to touch him, do one of the things they would heard of, and restore his ability to walk. And yet Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. I thought about that a lot this week, and I thought, you know, we, we are caught inside of a world that, that may care more about the physicality of the world than our spiritualism. I talk to people each week, and one of the questions that I ask them on a regular basis, how is it Jesus, or um, uh, Wesley used to say, how is it with your soul? Sometimes I'll say that, but often I'll just simply say, how are you doing spiritually? 
and it kind of takes people off guard a bit, you know, when you say, how are you doing spiritually? But I get into some great conversations with folks. The question I would ask you is, which would be more important for you, to be doing well spiritually or to be doing well physically? I tend to think we live in a world today where physicality is more important than spirituality. I think that's a problem. I believe that may be a problem for us in the church. The way in which some churches have addressed this is to come up with a theology that's called prosperity doctrine, where if you love God, God loves you back and everything's good. You know, it's where we begin to get this um, vending machine God, where we go and ask for something, we pull the thing and then we get it. Um, that's not the God that I understand my God to be. I think that my God cares more about me spiritually than he does about me physically. I had a buddy who, um, who was working really hard, many long, long hours, and he was trying to come up with um, a nut, a, an amount of money so that he could retire, and it was in the tens of millions. I don't remember exactly what it was. And he died a couple years ago. And one of the things that I want to ask him is, now that you're here, which was more important, your spiritual life or your physical life, earning a lot of money? I think I know the answer, but I just want to have the conversation because I think many of us are going through life really worrying about the physical things and we're not spending a great deal of time worrying about our relationship with God, our our walk with God, our walk with other Christians. Uh, that becomes a secondary or a tertiary kind of a thing for us. I think that's problematic. I wonder, I wonder if those people that were walking with Jesus or even Jesus himself as they're coming down the hill, if anybody said to themselves, huh, wonder why he said that he would forgive the sins of that guy. Now, no doubt you'll remember the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that some religious folks there got very upset that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Who are you to forgive the sins? And, and Jesus then turns to them. It's interesting to me. He knows what question they have in their head that they're not speaking to Jesus. And Jesus says to them, huh, really? Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or say stand up and walk but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth even to forgive sins he turned to the paralytic and said stand up take up your bed and go home Jesus dropping into Jerusalem through that Kidron Valley down and going up the hill and into Jerusalem, cleansing the temple, healing the people, talking with folks, the questions that came at him, the, 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 the religious folks that just kept hammering him over and over. I wondered if Jesus, on the way down the hill, said to himself, I've only got five days to live. Because they're going to kill me on Friday. I wonder if he said to himself, I've, I've only got four days to walk with my boys and to get them to understand. And I wonder if he said to himself, in a week from now, they're going to understand what it was that happened back at the lake when I said to that guy, the sins were forgiven. See, this week is the week that, that really turns the whole thing on its head. I mean, no doubt over the past few weeks, you have heard me and the scriptures say over and over as Jesus did something, even the Sermon on the Mount or the, uh, the, the Mount of Transfiguration, he turned to his disciples as he's coming down off the hill and he said, don't tell anybody about this. You don't yet understand what this is about. Even the, even the father, you know, sort of shouts down, shh, listen to him, he's my son. Stop talking, stop processing. You don't have the whole story yet. And over and over, the first guy that he runs into, the leper, each of these people that, 
over and over, he tells them, don't tell anybody because there's going to be a misunderstanding about what Jesus was about. And I think that great celebration of him coming down that hill was basically based upon a misunderstanding. Their thought was that Jesus was going to be the Messiah who was going to release all of this pressure off of them and reset them as a people, throw the Romans off. But this was not God's plan. God's plan was to, well, to go back to the Sermon on the Mount, to reset the cogs back where God wanted them to start with. Not on a power structure of, I'm over you, but I'm on a power structure of, I'm going to underpin you from below and lift you up. This is what Jesus came into the world to teach. He taught us to care for other people. And this is what he did. He cared for other people so that when they looked at him, he could then begin to explain to them what it was that he was going to do, which was to underpin them and underpin everyone else in the world. And it wasn't going to be the kind of a thing where a God lorded over top of them, but one who walked with them and one who underpinned their lives and one who cared for them and then wanted them to care for other people. That's what this week is about. Being holy whole. We've talked about uh, vessels, holy vessels this week, or this past uh, six Sundays. We've talked about uh, that, you know, sea glass is broken glass that gets tumbled in the sand and becomes something beautiful. You and I have become beautiful things as we get tumbled in our lives and we begin to see what's really important. We become people who understand life differently. I've never met anyone who's getting ready to leave this world that said to me, I wish I had more money. I wish I had worked more. I wish I had done. What I hear from people over and over is, I wish I would have spent more time with others. I wish I would have cared for others. I wish I would have done more to create opportunity inside of relationships that were broken. This is what I hear from people. And this, quite frankly, is what I hear from Jesus this week. I'd love for you to spend some time thinking, spend some time praying, spend some time reading the scriptures. Read this story about God coming into the world and dying on a cross for you and for me to give us something very, very special. My hope and prayer is that you have a wonderful week, that you take care of yours, and you spend a little time with the big guy. Amen. Amen. Now hear the prayers of the people. And please light your candle during the prayers. Healer of our every ill, especially when we find it difficult to believe or trust that sorrow will never end, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for the healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities and grief of our time. Even when we cannot seem to believe it, we know that you see the beauty in our brokenness. We pray especially for those who feel there is no end to the sorrow, that no matter what we do or how hard we work to bring peace and justice to our world, it feels like we cannot gain traction. We give thanks that when we cannot bring ourselves to the healing source of your love, there are others around us that, through words and actions, bring us to hope once again. Help to also be those who offer hope when we have the opportunity on this parade of compassion called life. We pray this day for... Now hear the prayer of Jesus. In your love make us whole. May we rest in your compassion. Calm the lost weary soul in the warmth of your love. May your peace fill our hearts. May we know the love of Jesus. By your grace, your console, make us holy, make us whole. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who love him, all who earnestly 
repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray silently for our sins. Hear the good news, the gospel. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Would you take a moment and pray a blessing on the tithes and offerings and sacrifices that we've received this week? Let us pray. Amen. singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Would you join me in the prayer of dedication? Generous God, we give thanks for all that you have given us. We return from it an offering for the sake of spreading love as the body of Christ. Open us, Lord, to even better ways to steward your creation under our care. Help us to aid you in bringing your kingdom to the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, raised it, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took a cup, an additional cup. He raised it, he gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, O Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, O Lord, and on these gifts of bread and wine and those at home. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church. Honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. be a sign and symbol of your sacrifice on the cross of Christ. Amen. You may receive your elements. Let's join in singing our closing hymn.
into the world empowered by the Spirit of God and be people who are filled with the wonder of this week. May you move from a time of celebration today to that of wonderment on Thursday evening in the upper room, to that of sorrow at the foot of the cross, to elation next Easter. We're going to do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you.